chapter one of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter one isabel's garden in the drawing-room of a house on the north side of prince's gardens a man and a woman were seated one winter's evening after dinner it was not a large room and it was by no means a unique one as far as its original structure was concerned for it was of the orthodox l-shape which obtained so largely in london drawing-rooms excepting in those of extremely recent manufacture but there was that indefinable air of comfort and elegance about it which certain women have the power to impart to their dwelling-places it was furnished entirely with green the most satisfactory of all colours for that purpose be the furniture that of an ordinary dwelling-place or of nature's great house not made with hands light green paper of the same hue as beech trees in spring dark green carpet and curtains of the same tint as mossy glades in summer and chairs and couches of as many and as varying shades of green as are woods when the evergreens and the larches are struggling for a majority therefore although it was only the beginning of february spring was already at home in this london drawing-room winter having been kept waiting outside ever since the end of october there were no outlying districts in this room as there are in so many the back drawing-room had not been converted as it usually is into a sort of court of the gentiles where outsiders congregate on uncomfortable chairs round an unused piano but was in its own way as much honoured and esteemed as the front drawing-room and was considered quite as respectable a place of residence as for the occupants of this pleasant room the man somewhere about forty years of age was tall and dark thin and thoughtful-looking the type of man who takes life and himself seriously and who finds his sole recreation in hard work the woman was cast altogether in a different mould she had the rounded plumpness which is inseparable from a light-hearted and easy-going disposition and the years whereof she boasted one or two less than her husband had dealt more tenderly with her than with him she was quick and active in all her movements but it was the activity of boundless energy rather than of feverish unrest her dark hair showed no trace of grey save to her own all-seeing vision and her eyes were as bright and blue as they had been when she was a girl they saw further now than they did then perhaps but their perceptions though more acute were less critical than in the old days although she lived in an age when domestic misery was the fashion and when happy marriages were as completely out of date as crinolines or paisley shawls she nevertheless loved and admired her husband with all her heart and mind and soul and strength otherwise she was as up-to-date and as modern as it is necessary for any woman to be it seems to me she suddenly remarked a propos of her own meditations that single life is like a road and married life is like a garden as how asked her husband looking up from his evening paper which after the manner of men he was devoutly studying well in this way single life is like a road because it is always leading on to something else it isn't meant to be a permanent place of residence and people who make it so are behaving like children of israel or gypsies they ought to fold up their tents a la longfellow's cares and the arabs and silently steal away it is against the rules not to move on paul seaton 
that was the name of the man in the green drawing-room smiled with that indulgent kind of smile which husbands are wont to use when they think their wives are talking nonsense and like them all the better for it you seem to consider single life a somewhat chilly and uncomfortable sort of business he remarked on the contrary i think there is a lot to be said for it in its own way of course it isn't as cosy and settled and living on your own property ish as marriage you must see that for yourself but it is more exciting because it is always the way to somewhere else and you are never quite sure where the next turn of the road will take you it is not only a road it is a road where all the finger-posts are pure guesswork but the milestones are not mrs seaton sighed no worse luck the milestones are dreadfully pronounced and staring before you are married and are always coming to meet you and then hitting you in the face after you are married they seem to get a bit moss-grown and you don't notice them nearly so much yes the portentous ominousness of the milestones is one of the greatest disadvantages of single life but this has its advantages all the same what else in addition to the mystery hidden round the next corner oh the delicious stranger and sojourner feeling that things are more or less temporary and so don't matter you can put up with lots of little inconveniences in a wayside inn that you couldn't tolerate for a moment in your own house it is really the picnic instinct that imbues you as long as you are single the same instinct that causes water boiled out of doors on a fire of your own lighting to make so much nicer tea than water boiled in the kitchen kettle but i don't think it does isabel shook her head reprovingly that is because you are getting old and have got married and the domestic instinct in your character has crowded out the picnic instinct seaton laughed but he listened he was one of those rare men or is it rather the husbands of the rare women who find the conversation of their wives more interesting than the newspaper you see mrs seaton continued i married late enough to know what both single and married life are like so i can speak as an expert in both still the fact that you knew nothing about either wouldn't have prevented you from doing that retorted her husband dryly oh paul how rude you are and just when i am talking so nicely and intelligently to you too intelligently i admit but hardly nicely you are now cutting me to the heart with your insinuations that when single life is bliss tis folly to be married you cannot expect your loving husband exactly to relish these panegyrics on single blessedness they aren't panegyrics they are merely statistics just to teach you the difference between being married and single good heavens i don't want teaching that i know it only too well by experience and paul seaton laughed the contented laugh of the man who has attained his heart's desire but i wish you'd say something now on the other side something in favour of the holy estate don't you know this present attitude of mind is really most depressing to me i'm going to only you are always in such a hurry to express your own opinions that you never give me time to get a word in edgeways excuse me my love i have never yet expressed my own opinion upon matrimony i should consider it impolite to do so in present company the lady tried not to laugh but failed the affection between paul seaton and his wife was so great and the camaraderie so perfect that they could afford to make fun of each other now and then but they took care never to do so before a third person it is a mistake for husbands and wives to chaff each other in the presence of an audience brothers and sisters can do so much as they like and as a rule the more they do it the fonder of each other they are but with married people it is different they have the dignity of an office to maintain the sanctity of a covenant to keep and it does not do for them to treat such things lightly when the eye of europe is upon them 
it is only when they are en tete a tete that they may safely unbend and may confess to themselves and to each other that there is a great deal that is very funny in both of them which undoubtedly there is whoever they may be after all admitted isabel although there is a certain amount of very nice excitement in living on a road which leads to nobody knows where it is the sort of excitement that palls after a time people get tired of not knowing what is going to happen next that is why hardly anybody really enjoys a story that comes out in a serial ordinary human nature likes to be in a position to peep at the end whenever it thinks fit hence the popularity of palmists and fortune-tellers and crystal balls i understand and it is when the road becomes too vague and unsettled that the garden comes in precisely and the garden is all that the road is not and never can be peaceful and guarded and final and secure and circumscribed added paul yes but i don't know that it is any the worse for that especially for women seaton rose from his chair came across the room to where his wife was sitting and began to stroke her hair his face was grave almost sad he was wondering whether after all isabel was contented with her part of the bargain whether his love was sufficient to compensate her for the gaiety and luxury and excitement she had given up when she married him though they had enough to live upon even when paul was out of office they were by no means rich people compared with the majority of their world they necessarily led a quiet life and isabel carnaby had been denied no possible luxury or excitement in the days when she lived with her uncle and aunt sir benjamin and lady farley her life then both out in india when sir benjamin held a governorship and afterwards in london and at elton manor had been one long round of gaiety and pleasure and paul was sometimes afraid that she might find the contrast between the past and the present too great that she was too modern a woman for marriage completely to satisfy her as it had satisfied her grandmothers wherein he showed that for all his love he did not yet entirely understand his wife so the garden is duller than the road he said and his voice had a pathetic ring in it perhaps that is to say it has fewer possibilities and less adventures and it doesn't lead anywhere yes it does whispered isabel nestling up to him it leads home it is home he answered as he stooped and kissed her but all the same i am afraid you find it a little dull at times my darling that's a man all over men never understand how much we say and how little we mean they have no atmosphere in their minds if you remark that you want a bit of fancy work just to keep your fingers employed they think that you are miserable in your marriage and are striving to deaden your anguish by ceaseless toil and if you say you feel as if you couldn't walk another thirty miles or so after hard's day exercise they think you are dying of exhaustion and ought to have an injection of strychnine well i can't help being a man i was born so consequently when you talk about marriage being a, a horrid sort of walled-in kitchen garden i naturally fear that you are finding it dull oh paul you are silly you really are i don't find it an atom dull i adore it but you must see for yourself that a garden is is well a garden is a garden isabel had not intended to finish her sentence thus lamely but experience had taught her that when people are in a sensitive mood the less one says to them the better explanations rarely explain anything therefore wise persons avoid them as much as possible she held her peace for fear of hurting her husband's feelings but she succeeded in doing so nevertheless just so was all he said but he said it in rather an injured tone 
don't be foolish darling she begged rubbing her cheek against his hand don't you see that when god made man perfectly happy he planted him in a garden and when he wanted to punish him he turned him out to a thorny and thistly highway so there's really nothing unkind to you in my comparing marriage to a garden in fact quite the reverse i see replied paul dryly no you don't whenever you say i see in that particular tone of voice it always means that you see something which isn't there paul smiled in spite of himself well what is all this leading up to i should like to know that's what i'm coming to a garden to be a really nice dressy garden must have things in it don't you see heaps and heaps of things it wants a lot more furnishing than a road does as long as the road has good high hedges on either side to keep travellers from going where they ought not to it needn't have flowers or fountains or shrubs or rockeries because people merely regard it as a means to an end and so don't mind if it is a bit sketchy but when you've got a garden of your own and mean to spend the rest of your life there you naturally want to fill it with all sorts of beautiful things isabel paused to take breath but paul did not speak how nice of you to keep quiet and listen she remarked approvingly that is where men are so much more restful to live with than women they let you say what you want to say without eternally trying to poke their own oars in you see she continued other women have children and careers and parishes and school boards and all sorts of things to furnish their gardens and keep them from seeming empty but i haven't unconsciously her voice quivered as she said the word children she did not notice it herself but paul did my poor darling he said and again laid a caressing hand upon the neat brown head isabel thrilled at his touch and in the same breath hoped that he wasn't roughing her hair much she prided herself upon always being a very spick-and-span person i'm not poor at all she retorted i've got you but i don't seem to be large enough for the place somehow that's where the tragedy comes in yes you are you are more than enough if only i could see enough of you but i can't if i could always be with you i should never want anything or anybody else even for five minutes you'd furnish any garden as completely as a cedar tree does but you are so busy with houses of commons and war offices and tiresome old things of that sort that often you haven't time to attend to me and it is then that the garden seems a bit empty my poor darling paul repeated isabel rattled on i can't for the life of me see what any woman can want in addition to a husband if the husband is anything like you and if he is always with her but if she is married to an alibi absentee landlord sort of a person who is always somewhere else than where she is at the time she wants something to fill up the intervals like those funny little street scenes in shakespeare's plays while the scenery is being changed i am afraid i do leave you alone a good bit replied her husband with a sigh but i cannot help it you know that don't you my darling i think you could help it more than you do if only you hadn't such an elephant of a conscience and such a hippopotamus of a sense of duty what on earth's the good of a man's being always at his post when the post happens to be a government office posts can stand still by themselves without wanting anybody to help them it is what they were made for that and deafness and when you say as deaf as a post you mean as deaf as a post in the government because they never listen to suggestions nor hear complaints but that's neither here nor there and isabel pursed up her lips and nodded her head with the air of one who could say a good deal more if she chose well what is the particular new toy that you want just now for the furnishing of your garden asked paul i am certain that you have one in your eye at the present moment he knew his isabel right as usual it's a girl an anglo-indian girl seaton fairly jumped 
isabel rarely succeeded in surprising him or taking him unawares he was pretty well accustomed to her vagaries by now but she did this time a girl good gracious what in the name of fortune do you want with a girl lots of things i want to instruct her and amuse her and entertain her and finally marry her who on earth do you want to marry her to several people you'll find it rather difficult to manage that the present marriage laws being as narrow and antiquated as they are paul don't be silly what i mean is that i've several people in my eye that i think would do for her and i shall let her choose which that is very generous of you my sweet but won't they have a say in the matter oh that's their lookout i can't bother about them who are they i'm not going to tell you please do i'm dying to know but isabel stood firm nothing would induce me to tell you you'd better it would make you feel much more comfortable in your own mind my mind is quite comfortable already thank you if anything too luxurious and it would amuse me immensely now it is always difficult for a woman to refrain from telling her husband anything that she thinks will amuse him in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred it is impossible but this happened to be the hundredth i'm not going to tell you isabel repeated sternly at least not yet paul's eye twinkled he knew that time which reveals all secrets was particularly rapid in revealing isabel's but all he said was then if i may not know the name of the happy man may i know that of the girl oh yes i don't mind telling you that it is fabia vipart and who in the name of all that's wonderful is fabia vipart her father was a major vipart in the indian army and her mother was a hindu at least her grandmother was and they are both dead both her grandmothers do you mean of course not they must have been dead for ages grandmothers nearly always are i mean her parents how very sad for the girl at least presumably so but how did you get to know her isabel i knew her father out in india when i was living there with the farleys he wanted to marry me an oriental custom i suppose and did the hindu lady object oh paul how silly you are he was a widower of course why of course i wasn't aware there was anything especially ephemeral about hindu ladies i said of course because if he hadn't been a widower he wouldn't have wanted to marry me i failed to see the logic of that i wasn't a widower and i wanted to marry you i never knew that you set up for being an emporium of only second-hand goods i dare say if you had been a widower you'd have had more wisdom or perhaps i should say experience than to want to marry me suggested isabel slyly not i my own i should always have been a fool where you were concerned but to return to miss fabia i gather that when you knew major vipart the hindu lady like wordsworth's lucy had ceased to be she's been dead for years and besides as i've explained to you she wasn't a hindu at all her mother was then is miss fabia black good gracious no exclaimed isabel her hair is dark of course but not as black as it is painted probably not many women's aren't when i was out in india she was quite a child a cream-coloured child with huge brown eyes she always reminded me of a dress i had of cream satin trimmed with brown velvet it was a very pretty dress and isabel's face grew soft with that tender expression which a woman's face always wears when she is recalling bygone garments that became her well it must have been and the prettiest bit was the lining as our old nurse martha used to say she never said it of my clothes or of joanna's by the way it was generally upon alice martin's wardrobe that this criticism was passed if i remember rightly joanna and i were plain children and it was considered conducive to our eternal salvation to make us believe that we were even plainer than we were which really was an act of supererogation you never were plain paul exclaimed isabel indignantly i won't let anybody say such things of my husband not even you nevertheless it is true sweetheart i was an ugly little beggar in those days and a prig at that 
but we are wandering from miss fabia her father wanted to marry you you say he was evidently a sensible man whatever her mother may have been her mother couldn't help being a hindu retorted isabel rather huffily it always annoyed her when english people spoke disrespectfully of foreign races but you have just said that she not only could help it but did oh paul i wish you wouldn't quibble in that silly way when i am trying to talk to you seriously it was the grandmother that couldn't help being a hindu and fabia could help it even less and yet people were very horrid to fabia about it and to her father too all right i understand miss fabia's grandmother could no more help being a hindu than her father could help wanting to marry you poor beggar i'm the last man to blame him but now where does the girl come in and what is her connection with the allegory of the marriage market i mean the marriage market garden well you see i've heard through aunt farley who still corresponds with a host of people out in india that fabia is extremely anxious to come to england for a time to see what english society is like so i thought it would be rather nice if i had her here for a few months and trotted her about and showed her round and then instructed and entertained and finally married her to that nameless knight whom you have in your eye now at last i begin to master the programme you wouldn't mind having her here would you darling asked isabel in a coaxing voice i shouldn't mind anything that gave you pleasure my dearest not even a girl though i own i am not very keen upon them as a rule well it would give me a good deal of pleasure to take a young girl about and watch her go through all the phases that i've been through myself it would be such fun teaching her all the things that i've learnt by experience she wouldn't learn much that way my sweet nobody does but that needn't interfere with your pleasure in teaching her it wouldn't she is quite young not much over twenty i should think so i shall be able to do whatever i like with her it isn't likely a girl of that age will have many plans and interests of her own as yet you must remember isabel that she probably will not look at life through your eyes as you seem to expect and you must not be disappointed if she doesn't she will look at life very much as i looked at it when i was her age replied isabel with a characteristic toss of her head you may know more about politics than i do my dear paul but you can't possibly know as much about girls thank heaven for that but i know a good deal about one woman and i think you make a mistake in expecting other people to be exactly like yourself because unfortunately they are not perhaps i am inclined to think too highly of my fellow-creatures replied isabel demurely but it is a good fault it is an absolutely charming fault as all yours are my darling said seaton kissing his wife but i must be off to the house invite your little indian girl by all means but don't be disappointed if she doesn't turn out to be as absolutely adorable as you are yourself because neither she nor anybody else possibly could thus it was settled that fabia vipart should come to stay with the paul seatons for the following season and isabel wrote out by the next mail to make all the necessary arrangements would she have written quite so glibly had she known all the trouble that the coming of fabia would involve perhaps not and yet if we were always prevented from doing anything for fear of possible consequences if we were always letting i dare not wait upon i would like the cat in the adage then not many a thing would be done when twere done and nothing would be done quickly End of chapter one chapter two of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter two fabia vipart a native gentleman dressed in european costume was sitting alone in the drawing-room of an indian bungalow he was a man in the prime of life with the narrow figure and small hands and feet of the true oriental his head was likewise small and his hair absolutely black 
no beard or moustache hid his firm yet delicately moulded mouth and chin and the upper part of his face showed considerable fineness of form a handsome man undoubtedly but with the beauty of the east rather than of the west a man likewise of considerable fascination but whose charm had something weird and uncanny about it he was one of those who strive to lift the veil of the great temple of nature and to pry into her hidden places and he had succeeded in wresting from her certain of those secrets which she in her wise and tender motherhood keeps as a rule concealed from the sons and daughters of men this meddling with the occult had left its mark upon him had set him apart as it were from the common herd and had loosened those bonds of sympathy which bind ordinary men and women to each other in this workaday world so that people felt awe for him rather than affection and found him fascinating rather than lovable the house in which he was sitting was not his own for it was full of signs of feminine habitation and ram chandar mukharaji was a bachelor it was the house of his distant cousin fabia vipart whom he had called to see and for whose appearance he was now patiently waiting and like all orientals he had mastered the art of patient waiting he did not fidget about the room as an englishman in the same circumstances would have done trying to find some book or newspaper to while away the time lest one minute of it should be lost that is to say should be unoccupied with outside interests but he sat quite still absorbed in his own thoughts with a stillness unknown to the children of the western races presently the swish of silken skirts was heard approaching and miss vipart entered the room then for the first time the face of the man showed signs of animation being illuminated with the light of a great joy that was all the more intense for being silent good morning fabia he said as he took her slim brown hand in his own his voice was as soft and silken in its tone as was the rustle of his cousin's skirts as sweet in fact as a woman's good morning ram chandar i am glad you have come because i want particularly to see you i have something to tell you of course i came i am always coming i only live in order to come here and i only go away in order to have the pleasure of coming again fabia smiled and sank down into a low chair stretching out her slender form luxuriously it would have been apparent to the most casual observer that those two belonged not only to the same race but also to the same family there was such a strong resemblance between them but the infusion of english blood in the girl's case placed the balance of beauty on her side she was some twenty years younger than her cousin which is always physically an advantage but in addition to this she had inherited something of her father's fibre though equally slender she was taller for a woman than mukharji was for a man as they stood together their eyes were almost on a level while his hair was a dead black hers was a dusky brown relieved by innumerable lights and shadows her nose and mouth were as finely formed as his but in place of his thin and colourless lips hers were a ripe crimson they had the same full forehead and flashing eyes but the expression of their faces was totally different there was no doubt that ram chandar was a handsome man but fabia was an exceptionally beautiful woman beautiful indeed as a dream but with something serpentine in the quality of her beauty something snake-like in the perfection of her grace i have to tell you she said and her voice too was like his in its softness of tone and slowness of movement that i am going away going away to england the man sat still and did not speak but his silence was heavy with the weight of suppressed passion 
fabia did not trouble to look at him these two knew each other so well that words even looks were unnecessary between them i am weary of the life here the girl went on weary of the routine and the emptiness and the frivolity weary most of all of the contempt of the anglo-indians as they call themselves so i am going to england then at last the man spoke you will hate it i think not i am partly english myself you see and the english part of me is homesick for england i can feel my father in me crying out to return to his native land you say the english out here despise you if they do what matters it they are but pariahs and dogs but still if they do so here will they not do so also in england and shall you like it any better there than here you are wrong ram chandar there is none of that prejudice in england that there is here against people of mixed races i have talked to men and women fresh from england and i know they will admire me all the more for it for that and for my beauty they are so commonplace themselves those english that they are ready to fall down and worship whatever is out of the common so that pure whiteness here and mixed whiteness in england are equally worthy of their adoration mukharji did not speak but he fixed his wonderful eyes on the girl and willed her to tell him all that was in her thoughts she moved her head restlessly under his gaze for half a minute then she answered him as if he had spoken i do not wish to keep anything from you i will tell you all that is in my heart there never have been any secrets between you and me there never can be i can read your soul my child as i read an open book and i tell you that you will hate those english when you see them in their own land i think not i think not ram chandar if i do not hate them now when they look down on me why should i hate them when they adore me for i mean them to adore me i have made up my mind to that and what i intend that i always accomplish again the man fixed his eyes on the girl without speaking and again she moved restlessly yet with infinite grace she was one of those rare women whose every movement is in itself a thing of beauty i despise them too utterly to hate them she continued but i want to show them my power to lord it over them as they now try to lord it over me and although i despise them they have a certain interest and charm for me i admire their big bodies and their fair complexions and it amuses me to trifle with their shallow little souls you had far better stay here fabia among your own people who understand you among my grandmother's people you mean you forget that i am more than half english he did not forget he never forgot that fabia belonged quite as much to the alien race as to his own and he was deeply and bitterly jealous of the foreigners in consequence for once the impenetrable veil of his reserve was lifted fabia do not go he entreated and this time there was passion in his voice as well as in his eyes stay here and be my wife i love you fabia i have always loved you you are part of my very soul then at last the girl turned lazily in her chair and looked at him and once more he forced the truth from her by the strength of his will i cannot marry you ram chandar i do not love you you are too much like myself if i marry i should like to marry a big strong englishman with a fair complexion and a big heart if i married you you would want to be my slave and i should not like that at all but the big strong englishman would be my master and would do with me whatsoever he would he would know none of my thoughts but i should know all of his and yet he would be the master because he would be strong and stupid in this world strength and stupidity are the great ruling powers nothing can stand against them and i should hate him for ruling over me ram chandar oh yes i should hate him but i should adore him for it all the same she paused but the man made no reply then as if impelled by some power stronger than herself she went on and although i despise them i resent their contempt for me i want to be one of themselves and to share their privileges and to hurt them as they have hurt me and my mother before me 
ram chandar i must go even if only for a short time if you go you will never come back in that case you can come to me perhaps so perhaps not that is as fate wills but what about all that i have taught you fabia what about all those hidden things to which no woman's mind save yours has ever been opened is all this to be wasted because you choose to live among english dogs who have no thoughts beyond their own vile bodies and to whom the world of spirits is for ever closed not necessarily it will be and necessarily but i will waste no more breath in argument your mind is made up and nothing will turn you you were not even half a mercargy if it would i loved your mother and she preferred an englishman to me i love her daughter and she will prefer an englishman to me it is as fate wills and nothing can alter it it is useless to fight against fate i submit my plans are all made said fabia in a sweet voice i had to make them by myself because you were away and mrs seaton wanted an answer by the next mail i wait to hear them if the man who had been a father to fabia ever since her own father's death was wounded by her cool independence of him he made no sign that he was he simply listened with an imperturbable face out of which he had smoothed every trace of his recent emotion i am going to stay for a few months with mrs paul seaton who lived here for four years with her uncle sir benjamin farley you remember him well and his wife also a soulless woman with a cultivated mind cultivated that is to say for an english woman they are generally such crude such untrained creatures then do you not remember their niece miss carnaby she became mrs paul seaton some years ago she must be quite old by this time well over thirty and i shall do whatever i like with her it isn't likely that a woman of that age will still have many plans and interests of her own fabia little recked that isabel had made the same remark almost word for word about her merely substituting young for old age is after all very much a question of perspective i remember her perfectly a noisy shallow sparkling brook of a woman the sort that the englishmen want to marry and consider themselves very fortunate if they succeed and ram chandar shuddered slightly papa did ah a look of ineffable disgust suffused the dark face he wanted that woman that empty babbling brook to fill your mother's place how english poor papa he was often very foolish and you hated her hated the chattering fool that was asked to step into your mother's shoes fabia smiled languidly no my dear ram chandar i did nothing of the kind to tell the truth i rather liked her although i despised her she was kind-hearted though too effusive for my taste and not nearly as offensively clever as she supposed herself a fool doubtless like most of her countrywomen by no means a fool a clever woman in a superficial way clever enough to know there were some things beyond her comprehension but not clever enough to try to comprehend them and you can forgive that woman for being asked to fill your mother's place you are indeed your father's daughter i can forgive any woman for being asked in marriage by any man it is her one possible diploma of merit the only woman i cannot forgive is the woman whom no man has asked in marriage she is a blot upon my sex you are cold fabia cold as ice and you are also cruel yet i love you the girl mocked him and i am also beautiful and yet you love me and i am also clever and yet you love me and i am also wealthy and yet you love me truly the love of man is a wonderful and a selfless thing again the handsome face put on its mask of immobility and whom did she finally marry this twenty-first love of your father a member of parliament what they call a radical by name paul seaton he is under secretary for the war office whatever that may mean he was poor too and she married for what she called love by which probably she meant a due sense of the unfitness of things and you can make yourself happy among such people for a time yes i am bored to death here i am tired of you all and have seen all that there is to see and have learnt by heart all there is to learn and i want a change 
and it never occurs to you to wonder what i want never wherein fabia spoke the simplest truth it never did occur to her to consider what anybody except herself thought or felt about anything at present she was completely and absolutely selfish she had schooled herself not to mind the social slights which in anglo-indian society the fact that she was a half-caste entailed upon her and she had succeeded in meeting them with the utmost indifference not to say contempt but they had had their effect upon her character all the same there are few baneful influences more difficult to withstand than that of continual social slights the iron of them is prone to enter into the strongest and purest souls and the iron does not invariably act as a tonic from sorrow and misfortune men and women often rise ennobled and purified but it is doubtful if a continuance of petty slights ever has a beneficial effect upon any human being it almost invariably hardens and embitters and changes the fairest elms into moraz indeed perhaps the cruelest part of losing a fortune is not its immediate effect upon ourselves but its effect upon our neighbours and their consequent treatment of us surely the king of israel was wise in his generation when he elected to fall into the hand of the lord rather than into the hands of men and what right have we forsooth in our mean and petty arrogance to distort and stultify the immortal souls of those men and women who happen to be less wealthy or well-born than ourselves what right have we in our smug self-complacency to deface the divine image and superscription on the current coin of our father's realm our only excuse is that we are ignorant of the harm we are doing the effect of a social snub being as a rule out of all proportion to the cause therefore the next time we feel constrained in our fancied superiority to teach as we phrase it some less fortunate fellow-man his place let us take care that our innate snobbishness and our cultivated insolence are not endangering the soul of a weaker brother thus it was not altogether poor fabia's fault that she was cold and selfish and hard it was rather the fault of those fashionable friends of her father's who felt it incumbent upon them to indicate their own social superiority by displaying a studied exclusiveness towards all those not of their own race or order but though the fault might be theirs the onus of the result rested with her and she like the rest of us had to take the consequences of her own failings to suffer the defects of her own qualities she had loved her mother more than she had ever loved her father but her admiration and respect were always put down to the latter's score the fact that he belonged to the dominant race had influenced her every thought of him and her very bitterness against the attitude of his people towards her was a proof that she invariably recognized their superiority her mother died when she was still a child and her father when she was just developing into womanhood since his death her mother's kinsman ram chandar mukharjee had taken charge of herself and her property providing her with a duenna in the shape of a cast-off though eminently worthy governess whom the family of an english resident had outgrown underneath the almost oriental languor of fabia's manner her mind was feverishly active she was never really at rest never content consequently she was soon wearied of poor miss jones's conscientious supervision and plumed her radiant wings for wider flight it was then that isabel heard of her and her desire to come to england through one of lady farley's anglo-indian friends and mrs seaton sent out her invitation just in the nick of time when fabia felt that she could endure india and miss jones no longer 
the girl had inherited a handsome fortune and large estates from her mother and she had the independence and the intolerance of restraint which are the invariable attributes of moneyed immaturity thus she was as pleased at the idea of coming to the seatons as mrs seaton was at the idea of receiving her and she was just as set upon managing isabel as isabel was set upon managing her and the result of the contest between these two strong and self-willed women still lay in the lap of the gods end of chapter two chapter three of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter three the scourge of the red cord fabia came to england as had been arranged and was received by mrs paul seaton with open arms but miss vipart had not been long at prince's gardens before isabel realized that she had opened her arms a little too wide before understanding all the bearings of the case she at once confided the discovery of this error and her repentance of the same to paul who like a good husband and unlike a good wife carefully refrained from saying anything which even by the freest translation could be construed into i told you so he was for sending fabia back to india by return of post so to speak having again like a good husband no sense of proportion where his wife and his wife's interests were concerned the man who is alive to the laws of perspective with regard to the woman that he loves had better take at once a self-imposed vow of celibacy for while the world stands he will never make a passable husband but isabel with that innate sense of justice in which it pleases men to imagine that all women are fundamentally lacking felt that such a course of conduct would be most unfair to her guest and put the temptation away from her accordingly it was not really the fault of either woman that the two did not as the phrase runs get on well together they met with the full intention of liking each other extremely and of being great friends as the fashionable world counts friendships but the fact was that they were absolutely incapable of understanding one another and true friendship without mutual comprehension is a contradiction in terms it was no fault of isabel's that in spite of all the efforts to understand fabia's character she signally failed on the contrary this failure was rather to her credit than otherwise with all her faults of which she had her proper and normal share there was not one grain of bitterness or acidity in isabel's character she was constitutionally incapable of feeling either the one or the other true in the old half-forgotten days she had written a book which was noted for its bitter cynicism but that was but the expression of a temporary phase which was altogether foreign to her natural bent of mind she had dipped her pen in gall as she wrote but the pen-wiper was ever at hand to remove the foreign substance as soon as she had done with it and it had never even temporarily stained her white fingers of acidity she was incapable even momentarily that could never tinge even a passing thought in her mind she might have been somewhat hard and thoughtless and capricious in her young days her detractors said that she was but none of them could ever accuse her of being soured by the experience of life perhaps there was more invigorating saltness than cloying sweetness in her nature but be it remembered salt is further removed from acidity than is even sugar and after all hardness and thoughtlessness are faults of youth which decrease with advancing years while bitterness and acidity only eat deeper and deeper as time rolls on into the lives of those who harbour them 
but because of this very saneness of character which might make her outwardly hard but never inwardly bitter isabel found it impossible to enter into fabia's feelings and was consequently perhaps a little severe and unsympathetic with the girl she had never experienced that social ostracism which had entered as iron into fabia's soul therefore she was incapable of appreciating its effect upon the girl's character she pitied her for it it is true but pity is often not akin to sympathy whatever it may be to love we must all have the defects of our qualities and isabel therefore could not escape the inherent limitations of the healthy-minded unaffected humorous successful woman fabia on the other hand could not escape the defects of the passionate highly strung reserved thoughtful introspective girl to her superfine sensibilities isabel appeared a little harsh and rough while to isabel's common sense and unfailing humour fabia's supersensitiveness of mind and body seemed decidedly unhealthy and morbid although she never mentioned it to anybody fabia's visit to england was a far greater disappointment to herself than it was to her hostess she had had an idea that when once she was in england among her father's people the feeling of loneliness which had oppressed her all her life would vanish instead of which she felt more isolated here than she had ever done at home it is strange that sense of loneliness and isolation which appears to be the unalterable lot of certain souls they are set apart from their fellows why they know not and nothing that they say or do can break down the wall of partition that stands between themselves and other men from her earliest infancy fabia had been a prey to this terrible feeling of solitariness as a child if other children came to play with her at her own house they always played with each other and left her out in the cold and as a girl the same thing happened with regard to other girls even her great beauty and undeniable intellectual powers did not help her in fact they seemed to place her still further apart from other people no one but herself knew how fiercely she envied those commonplace girls who had their full share of brothers and sisters and more than their full share of bosom friends nor how passionately she resented those qualities in herself which prevented her companions from being comfortably intimate with her and now that she had at last attained her heart's desire and come to england it was just the same people admired and feted her because of her beauty and accomplishments but they never treated her as one of themselves as they treated isabel and fabia was too quick not to see this they were never rude to her as they had been in india never even impolite but there was a subtle suggestion in the atmosphere that she was a visitor rather than a relation a stranger to be entertained rather than a friend to be welcomed many women would not have been conscious of this but fabia's perceptions were abnormally acute and however much people might flatter her she knew in a moment when they did not like her and agonized accordingly isabel on the other hand possessed in a marked degree the gift of friendliness and camaraderie every one who knew her felt that they had known her all her life she had such a wonderful knack of finding some common ground whereon herself and the most unlikely person could meet and fraternize and this quality in her hostess made poor fabia realize the more poignantly her own loneliness and desolation humanity is divided into two sets of people the people who are inside the red cord and the people who are outside there is no other division that really matters those who are inside are cheerful and comfortable and well liking at peace with gods and men and with everybody except outsiders while those outside are unhappy and desolate and oppressed at war with themselves and each other and bitterly vindictive against those happier beings within the sacred enclosure and it is all the fault of the red cord there are red cords in all worlds and in all phases of life social personal religious and one's happiness mainly depends upon one's relative position towards these said red cords 
it is a cruel thing this red cord cruel fundamentally to those on both sides of it it fills those within with hardness of heart pride vainglory and hypocrisy and those without with envy hatred and malice and all uncharitableness it is old to this red cord old as human nature ishmael had felt the scourge of it when his hand was against every man and every man's hand against his and those daughters of heth from whom esau chose his wife had learnt how pitiless it could be although inimical to the true spirit of christianity it nevertheless continued to exist after the dawning of the dayspring from on high even the great apostle upon whom the church was built knew how to wield it to the confounding of the gentiles and it was not until the vision of the great vessel had been vouchsafed to him three times that he was content to lay it down it was responsible for the tortures of the spanish inquisition for the horrors of the french revolution it is still responsible for most of the evils of social and political and religious life ever since she could remember fabia vipart had writhed under the scourge of the red cord it had lashed her naturally tender spirit into revolt and rebellion by its merciless system of exclusiveness and isabel seaton who had been born and bred within the select circle and who had never known the misery of those whom society chooses to consign to outer darkness was as ignorant as a babe of all that fabia suffered and as intolerant as a child of the outward signs of that suffering moreover the two women were somewhat far apart in years and so lacked the free masonry of contemporaries if we are considerably older than anybody else it does not invariably follow that we are wiser but it invariably follows that we think we are and nothing will convince us to the contrary therefore isabel was fully prepared to advise and instruct her junior and her junior obstinately refused to be advised or instructed wherein lay the raw material for the manufacture of open warfare one afternoon about a month after fabia's arrival in england she and her hostess were sitting chatting in the drawing-room in prince's gardens and the conversation turned upon miss vipart's general discontent with life you should marry remarked isabel you find it the most diverting arrangement and you can't think how much more cosy and cheerful it makes everything fabia looked lazily at her hostess through half-closed eyelids you didn't always think so for you were in no special hurry to get married yourself you must have been nearly thirty horrid little thing exclaimed isabel to herself i'll tell paul that the very minute he comes home the recital to paul of fabia's daily iniquities was one of the chief delights of isabel's life just now and a wonderful support to her in her endurance of such an incubus but all that she said aloud was twenty-nine and she said it quite good-humouredly fabia smiled you have an admirable temper isabel isabel had insisted upon fabia's calling her by her christian name the moment she arrived paul had said privately to his wife that he considered this a mistake but had been overruled now isabel was never tired of telling paul how much she wished fabia would call her mrs seaton as she couldn't bear people who didn't like her to call her isabel i know it's a regular beauty she replied i'm not sure that i ever met anybody with a better taking it all round that is to say except where paul is concerned i used to be perfectly vile to him when we were engaged a regular little devil but why i haven't a notion you were in love with him weren't you of course that was the reason that is absurd simply absurd if ever i were so foolish as to be in love with a man or so wise i should be an angel to him all the time naturally because you aren't an angel to anybody else i was an expression of languid amusement spread itself over fabia's face although she was at war with isabel in her heart she was usually entertained by the conversation of the latter the difference between the two women was this fabia sometimes was conscious of isabel's charm isabel never was conscious of fabia's 
fabia could have loved isabel had she allowed herself to do so isabel tried to love fabia and had failed yet isabel was invariably kind to fabia and fabia was often very unkind to isabel such are the ironies of feminine friendship i fail to see the sequence of thought she said please explain haven't you noticed that amiable women are generally cross with the men they love and cross women are generally amiable with the men they love i once asked a tremendously wise and clever man the reason of this and what did he say i forget what he said but i remember what i said and that was that we offer the greatest rarities as the greatest luxuries to our guests on the same principle as we give them strawberries in december and ice in june so that the good-tempered woman's bad temper and the bad-tempered woman's good temper are special delicacies all the same i cannot imagine your being bad-tempered and disagreeable it would be altogether out of drawing isabel's easy good-humour was a constant source of wonder to fabia being made herself on such different lines she had no idea how easy it was mrs seaton nodded sagely can't you you just ask paul he wouldn't tell me if i did don't you know him better than that of course he wouldn't that's where husbands are so splendid they always stick up for you whether you're right or whether you're wrong in fact rather more when you're wrong than when you're right they consider that is playing the game so it is i often wonder continued isabel in a meditative manner what paul really thinks of me he can't possibly think as highly of me as he seems to do because nobody could in fact nobody else pretends to and yet he knows me better than anybody else does it's queer you can't help admitting that it's queer fabia laughed softly very queer indeed and there's lots of other queer things besides continued mrs seaton waxing more communicative i used to think before i was married that when husbands and wives pretended they didn't see each other's faults it was all humbug but now i find that it wasn't of course it is utterly absurd i know but all the same it's true i do not believe it if i had a husband i should see his faults fast enough i couldn't help it even if i tried yes you could you couldn't help not helping it but i should feel such a fool and you would be that's the beauty of it and isabel laughed a rippling little laugh of pure happiness that's why married life is so good for one she continued you find yourself doing the very things that you've screamed with laughter at other women for doing and this teaches you better than a whole library of books or a complete course of oxford extension lectures that you are not one whit better or wiser than everybody else but that is a lesson that i should hate to learn objected fabia who was one of the women who derive a painful pleasure from the notion that no one ever felt as they feel or suffered as they suffer although she hated her solitariness she was in a sense proud of it human nature having a strange knack of feeling pride in its own deficiencies as well as in its own excellencies delicate people are as proud of their delicacy as strong ones are of their strength and small men are as proud of their light weight as big ones are of their bulk life is full of compensations and our own good conceit of ourselves is by no means the least of them it is no use hating things if you've got to learn them replied isabel with her usual sound sense it only makes life more unpleasant than it need be and does nobody any good but don't you hate to find that you are the same as other people not a bit of it i enjoy the joke and the fact that it is at my own expense makes me enjoy it all the more as i can understand better than anybody else can how excessively funny it is wherein mrs seaton spoke no less than the truth for she was one of the happy beings and their name is by no means legion who derive unfeigned and solid pleasure from a joke at their own expense such persons are rare and they are almost always feminine a man who laughs heartily and naturally at his own absurdity is a very black swan indeed men smile it is true at these ill-timed and inappropriate jests but the smiles are generally of that sickly and watery character which reminds one of a sunset on a rainy day nine women out of ten do not even smile at humour whereof they themselves are the unwilling butts they frown and glower and sulk 
but the tenth woman not only smiles but laughs with all her heart holding her sides in the exuberance of her mirth as no man has ever held his at fun poked at himself and isabel seaton happened to be the tenth you didn't really know me before i was married she continued with that irresistible candour which had ever been one of her greatest charms so you've no idea how egregiously conceited i was and how much cleverer i thought myself than anybody else or in fact than anybody else thought me either and therefore you can't understand what a killing joke it is to me to see myself developing into the ordinary commonplace domestic and devoted wife it makes me laugh every time i think of it doubtless it is very romantic when the ugly duckling turns into the snow-white swan but the real joke comes in when the promising signet develops into the humdrum barn-door fowl and that is my case to a t i'm very humdrum and excessively barn-door but i've got the saving grace left to see that it's funny and isabel laughed softly to herself as long as you're funny and know that you are funny you aren't well you are not quite so funny as you would otherwise have been i do not understand you at all i couldn't go on doing a thing that i knew was ridiculous i might be ridiculous without knowing it i suppose everybody is sometimes but i would rather die than be ridiculous consciously i hate to be laughed at it is absolute torture to me isabel nestled into her easy chair with that snug cosiness of hers which forms such a marked contrast to fabia's lithe grace then you make a great mistake half the fun of life consists in seeing how funny you are yourself and in watching other people find it out but fabia still looked puzzled as she said it was torture to her to be laughed at for she was one of those supersensitive souls who are not shielded by a saving sense of humour therefore isabel's attitude of mind was incomprehensible to her perhaps the fact that one woman had been born inside the red cord and the other outside accounted for the phenomenon in both cases i used to roar with laughter continued isabel at women who couldn't see their husbands faults it used to seem too utterly idiotic for anything and yet now for the life of me though i see paul's mistakes i cannot discover his faults i know they must be there like mrs wilfer's petticoat because everybody has them and nobody is an exception but try as i will i can't find them out you are candid at all events remarked fabia who was as yet too young to decide whether to despise her friend for being a fool or to admire her for confessing it according to the poet gray the boys at eton had learned the truth that sometimes tis folly to be wise but the soundness of the inverse platitude that sometimes tis wisdom to be foolish is never grasped by those on the so-called sunny side of thirty i always try to be for there's nothing i hate so much as humbug and affectation there's a lot of that going about nowadays my dear fabia especially on the subject of marriage and i want you to be on your guard against it and not to be choked off any really nice match just because of the nonsense preached by silly women and modern novels which bring me to the point of the conversation from which i started i generally get round to my starting point if you only give me time like the oft-quoted boomerang suggested fabia thus setting her loquacious hostess upon a fresh track oh my dear there's no greater delusion than the idea that boomerangs invariably travel with a return ticket we've got one in the corner of this very drawing-room which was once given me by someone who had been to australia if that is where boomerangs grow i forget who it was i remember it was someone who was in love with me at the time but i can't for the life of me recall his name anyway i thought it rather an interesting object to have about the sort of thing that promotes conversation don't you know so when we came to live here i stuck it up at the back of the cosy corner supported by two venetian glass vases that somebody else gave us for a wedding present i have seen it happily captain gaythorne caught sight of it one day when he was being even duller than usual and it started him on quite an intelligent description of his travels in india that being the nearest to australia that he could manage that is just what it was put there for every drawing-room ornament should have in it the germ of a conversation it is its raison d'etre i suppose that is why country people have upon their chimney-pieces bunches of the plant called honesty 
it gives them an opportunity of expatiating upon that overrated virtue and of so drifting into the universal pleasure of telling unpleasant truths to one's friends and neighbours i remember he discoursed exhaustively upon the time-honoured subject of boomerangs and told long tales of how they invariably came back like curses to roost do they that's all he knows if you so much as breathe when you are anywhere near to ours it at once tumbles behind the cosy corner breaking any wedding presents that it comes across on its way and then does it come back to where it started from not a bit of it it remains in retreat like a devotee until somebody breaks their own bones and more wedding presents by creeping under the seat of the cosy corner to fetch it out i know its little ways and mrs seaton shook her head reflectively if you have many friends like captain gaythorne i do not wonder that you select drawing-room ornaments that start conversation said fabia with that touch of sarcasm which generally flavoured her remarks yet on the whole she liked captain gaythorne liked him better than any one she had as yet met since she came to england she was by no means the first woman who has abused men because she liked them and gone near spoiling her own life and theirs accordingly nor will she be the last it is merely a symptom of a certain sort of shyness and not the worst sort of shyness either but isabel was not the woman to appreciate or sympathize with shyness of any kind now i won't have you abusing charlie gaythorne she cried i won't allow it in my drawing-room under the shadow of my own boomerang charlie is my darling as you have probably heard before or words to that effect and besides he is one of the men i want you to marry the girl winced she hated isabel's easy half insolent way of disposing of her as if she were a parcel of foreign imports and yet there was a sort of attractiveness about the insolence all the same it was so good-humoured she was beginning to understand why her father had once wanted to marry this woman it was the same sort of reason which in a minor degree had made him enjoy a sharp wind and a cold bath a reason which no pure oriental could ever have comprehended but fabia was no pure oriental there was a strong strain of western thought and feeling in her composition and it was probably her eastern sense of reserve and mystery underlying her western inclination towards all that was essentially british and modern that endowed the girl with so strong a fascination the fascination of incongruity made congress that she possessed fascination there was no doubt but it was purely a personal magnetism not an intellectual one those who merely read her history will probably find her without charm but those who met her face to face felt it in the very marrow of their bones you are always wanting people to get married she said it seems to be your one idea of entertainment i believe it is the only thing that permanently amuses anybody admitted isabel and it fails to do even that with some now fabio as i said before i won't allow you to get absurd modern notions about matrimony it is the fashion nowadays to pretend that most marriages are unhappy but they are not not a bit of it you think it is all pure affectation i think it is all pure rot replied mrs seaton with more force than elegance we are told all sorts of nonsense about marriages being increasingly difficult under modern conditions etc etc and all sorts of silly ways are suggested of untying the knot as if modern conditions cancel divine laws some things alter as times change and some things don't and sacraments and commandments are among the things that don't we may need a new bradshaw every month but we don't need a new bible then do you mean to say that you don't believe that it is far more difficult for us to find happiness in marriage than it was for your grandmothers persisted fabia who had sufficiently saturated her mind with current literature to have caught the taint of certain phases of modern thought not an atom replied isabel with fine scorn it is merely the fashion nowadays for women to pretend that they don't fear god or love their husbands while as a matter of fact ninety-nine women out of every hundred do both they can't help doing it it's what they were made for a woman who is bottom of her heart doesn't fear god and love her husband is a freak and the proper place for freaks is barnum's 
then do you fear god and love your husband asked fabia yes with all my heart and what is more i am not ashamed of it as so many women are ashamed of it indeed why the sun might just as well be ashamed of shining or the moon of giving light as a woman of doing the two things for which she was created if i had a husband fabia remarked i should never let him know how much i loved him shouldn't you i know better and isabel whistled softly to herself in a manner at once inelegant and expressive no i should just wear his heart upon my sleeve and peck at it whenever i felt inclined fabia persisted but i should never let him know what was in my mind so i used to think in my single days but when you're married you'll find the sleeve is on the other leg so to speak he'll wear your heart upon his sleeve and do whatever he likes with it but he won't peck at it because men aren't pecking animals and you'll love to have it so fabia smiled she was again reminded of her father and his cold baths and windy rides and so you want me to marry that stupid captain gaythorne surely he is too stupid to want to marry me not he he adores you and he'd be an excellent husband it was characteristic of isabel that she did not say or even think that he would also be an excellent match fabia noticed this omission and put it down in her own mind to isabel's credit there was a strain of fine unworldliness about this finished woman of the world that highly commended itself to a girl brought up as fabia had been in the whole of isabel's complex nature there was not one grain of snobbishness somewhat rare praise to be given to the sons and daughters of western nations and fabia accorded it ungrudgingly but he has got a face like a cherub's she objected he has got a much better figure than a cherub retorted isabel i don't know that a cherub has a bad figure what there is of it but there's plenty of charlie's figure such as it is at that moment the butler flung open the door announcing mrs gaythorne and captain gaythorne talk of the angels and the devil begins wagging his tail murmured isabel under her breath as she rose to receive her visitors End of chapter three chapter four of the subjection of isabel carnaby this is a librivox recording all librivox recordings are in the public domain for more information or to volunteer please visit librivox dot org the subjection of isabel carnaby by ellen thornycroft fowler chapter four the gaythorns fabia was right when she said that charlie gaythorne had the face of a cherub and isabel was still more correct when she asserted that he had not the figure of one he was one of those huge men with the form and strength of an athlete and the complexion and heart of a little child who are essentially a home product and flourish nowhere save in british soil even more typically than isabel herself he represented the denizens of that happy land which lies securely within the precincts of the red cord for over five centuries the gaythornes had dwelt at gaythorne manor in the county of mareshire and had done there whatsoever seemed right in their own eyes in fact in the eyes of all mareshire whatsoever a gaythorne did became right simply because it was done by a gaythorne so that it would have been difficult not to say impossible for a gaythorne to do wrong but the gaythornes were no unworthy race trailing their honour in the dust and using their liberty as a cloak for lower things they appreciated the duties and the responsibilities of their local infallibility as seriously as any pope could have done and fulfilled and accepted them accordingly they were one of the families that make us realize the advantages of the feudal system as it existed in the middle ages and that it had its advantages there is no doubt the gaythorne men had ever been strong-limbed light-complexioned and clean-living 
fearing god and honouring the king as all true squires should and the dames of their choice had ever been fair women not without discretion withal whose husbands and children had risen up and called them blessed of intellectual gifts to this worthy house nature perhaps had been sparing no gaythorne had ever written books or painted pictures or intruded his fingers into the pies of state there was little originality or individuality in this blameless family's records each squire gaythorne had been the squire gaythorne of his day neither more nor less each had been one of a set rather than a unique specimen an excellent match to the rest of the set it is true but not interesting as a personality charlie's father had been a perfect instance of the accepted gaythorne type too perfect for there to be anything else to be said about him he died just after an indian frontier war in which charlie had won distinction and nearly lost an arm whereupon charlie left the service and entered into his kingdom and was now reigning at gaythorne manor with his mother as grand vizier charlie had a very high opinion of his mother so had she there were few if indeed any matters small or great upon which mrs gaythorne did not feel herself competent to give an opinion and mrs gaythorne's opinions were of the same nature as royal invitations they were expected to be received as commands she had been and still was a fine-looking woman of the stately and statuesque order and it would be difficult to say whether she most resembled a highly religious juno or a somewhat worldly madonna she was not exactly clever but had a way of enunciating commonplace remarks with such force and authority that few of her hearers recognized them as platitudes she was a very good woman according to her lights and though these lights might be lamps of a somewhat antiquated pattern they had proved themselves safe and sure lanterns to guide more than one pair of wandering feet into the way of peace mrs gaythorne invariably dressed in black thereby showing respect for her husband's memory and for st peter's injunction as to female dress at the same time but her broad and ample bosom was as gay as any flower-garden with various and many-coloured ribbons testifying to the various virtues she adorned she wore a blue ribbon to show she was temperate and a white ribbon to show she was chaste a yellow ribbon to show she was conservative and a green ribbon to show she was kind an orange ribbon to show she was protestant and a purple ribbon to show she was truthful and so on through the whole prism of the primary and secondary and even tertiary virtues not that there was any need for the aid of these coloured illustrations to prove to the most superficial observer that mrs gaythorne was all and even more than all that she should be but she wore them as she herself explained for the force of example she was a sort of religious decoy duck decking herself in those moral feathers which are popularly supposed to produce moral birds if mrs gaythorne wore a ribbon all the women in gaythorne village were expected to wear it also and moreover to practise that inward and spiritual grace whereof it was the outward and visible sign a practice which did not come quite so easy to some of them as it did to the lady of the manor now in charlie gaythorne's life up to the present time there had only happened three events of importance the war on the indian frontier his father's death and his meeting with fabia vipart it was these three things that had made a man of him with the first two this story has not to deal but without the last it could hardly have been written the moment that captain gaythorne saw fabia's face he fell in love with it and with her in her official position as its owner 
of the subtlety of her intellect he knew nothing at all and cared less it was enough for him and more than enough for his peace of mind that she was beautiful and beautiful without doubt she was there is a theory abroad among women that the love which is founded upon intellectual gifts is more enduring than the love which is founded upon personal attractions probably it does wear well as all stiff and rather wiry materials do but softer and warmer stuffs wear well also the love that wears best of all in fact the only love that is really worth having is not the love that loves my love with a b because she is beautiful nor the love that loves my c because she is clever but the love that loves my love with an s because she is she and i am i and we too are ourselves and therefore each other for all time and eternity there is no better reason for love than this which is still the better for being no reason at all captain gaythorne had not only fallen in love with fabia he had made up his mind to marry the woman whom he loved if the woman whom he feared approved and it was with the hope of obtaining this approval that he had brought mrs gaythorne to call at prince's gardens this very afternoon to be introduced to the lady of his choice it was characteristic of charlie and therefore of all the gaythornes that the woman upon whose probable consent depended his proposal was not the woman to whom he wished to propose but his mother it never even occurred to him that fabia might object to marrying him but it occurred to him with uncomfortable persistence that mrs gaythorne might object to his marrying fabia and he felt that he could never make his offer of marriage if she did yet charlie had won a d s o in india and had been accounted a brave and dangerous enemy by the natives thus do our female relations make cowards of us all isabel duly introduced fabia to mrs gaythorne and then rang the bell for tea at least she set out with the intention of ringing the bell but charlie with his accustomed politeness insisted on forestalling her and with unaccustomed haste and nervousness succeeded in upsetting the boomerang three vases two photographs and a bunch of pampas grass in the attempt he was eager to repair his crime by picking them up again but isabel wisely begged him to forbear and to upset nothing more as she said she did not see the use of throwing good ornaments after bad ones especially when the ornaments happened to belong to her i shall be glad of my tea remarked mrs gaythorne when the commotion had subsided i am thirsty she spoke as impressively as if she were announcing some great scientific truth i have just been taking the chair at the annual meeting of the society for the propagation of the church hymnal among the inhabitants of the antarctic circle and am now on my way to preside at the annual meeting of the anti-tomato league for the suppression of tomatoes as an article of diet and consequently i require a little refreshment mrs gaythorne was guilty of one human frailty namely an inordinate affectation for presiding over public meetings on this matter she knew neither temperance nor restraint as some women take stimulants and other sedatives so mrs gaythorne took chairs i never partake of this delicious beverage the good lady remarked when at last her fleshly cravings had been satisfied without thinking of the teeming millions in china who still dwell in outer darkness and without thanking the goodness and the grace which saw fit to plant me in so much more favourable surroundings favourable alike to my natural and spiritual condition charles 
the muffins charlie hastened to lift a hot plate of these delicacies from the fireplace and offer them to his hungry parent this manoeuvre he carried out successfully as he was gradually gaining strength and confidence and was far less nervous than when he entered the room at present all had gone smoothly between his mother and the young lady she had been brought to inspect as he phrased it to himself they are getting on like a house on fire true the conversation had hitherto confined itself to such topics as might have been selected on the occasion of a visit from a thermometer to an aneroid namely the present weather and temperature and the prospects of more weather and temperature in the future but the interchange of such items of atmospheric information as had been public property for the last twenty-four hours was carried on in so cordial a spirit that charlie's spirits rose considerably his mother too was evidently enjoying her tea which was a good sign but alas her carnal needs having been supplied she unfortunately turned to higher subjects isabel have you seen anything of gabriel carr lately she suddenly inquired in her strident voice yes mrs gaythorne he was having tea with me last sunday and was as charming and delightful as ever having tea and on a sunday too i should have thought that a clergyman might have been better employed isabel hastened to defend her friend he was better employed as it happened he had been preaching in the afternoon at st cuthbert's and was going to preach at st hilda's so he called and had tea here on his way in order not to waste his time by going back home i cannot approve of sunday visiting for clergymen they ought to be preparing their sermons in the intervals between delivering them and not to be wasting the time in eating and drinking charles another muffin and you isabel i will trouble for a third cup of tea i feel quite exhausted after my speech upon antarctic hymnology and i shall never be able to do justice to the anti-tomato question unless i am fully fortified the dutiful charles hastened to fortify his mother assisted by isabel and the excellent lady calmly continued i am distressed deeply distressed to hear that gabriel has introduced flowers upon the communion table at his own church real flowers she added as if artificial ones would have been less heinous in her eyes why on earth shouldn't he demanded isabel who was nothing if not courageous because it is popish and therefore wrong that doesn't follow in the first place i don't agree with you that it is even what you call popish but even if it were that wouldn't prove that it was wrong the two terms are not synonymous you might just as well say that because the thing was protestant it was therefore right that is precisely what i should say isabella moreover the romans are so narrow and bigoted believing that no man is right except themselves and we all know that narrowness and bigotry are most unchristian they certainly are mrs gaythorne but all the same i cannot agree with you in calling things roman which are merely catholic charlie moved in his chair uneasily he did not want to marry isabel so it did not much matter what her religious opinions were but all the same he wished she wouldn't inflame his mother and just when things seemed going so smoothly too isabella exclaimed mrs gaythorne i am surprised at you you ought to know better i do know better that's what i'm just saying retorted the graceless one with a laugh miss vipart said mrs gaythorne turning so suddenly upon fabia that that young lady fairly jumped i trust that you do not approve of ritualism 
not at all replied fabia with some truth and charlie breathed freely again i am glad to hear that very glad it is a terrible snare to the young by the young mrs gaythorne was referring to isabel but naturally fabia did not grasp this why to the young especially she innocently asked because the young are foolish and ignorant being sadly prone to run after any new fad that takes their fancy charles what is the time i must on no account be late for the anti-tomato meeting half past five mother shall i call you a cab not for another ten minutes my meeting does not begin until six o'clock and i consider it just as much a sin against the true spirit of punctuality to be too early as to be too late isabella i repeat that i do not understand your present attitude of mind probably not replied isabel still mrs gaythorne i repeat that if as you say gabriel carr has flowers upon the altar i think he is quite right i did not say so isabella how can you so misinterpret me i said upon the communion table and mrs gaythorne fairly glared but isabel stuck to her guns if it is right for us to beautify our own houses with flowers why isn't it right for us to beautify god's house i consider that even in our own dwellings things of that kind are apt to harbour dust and mrs gaythorne glared significantly at isabel's overturned pampas grass the latter could not help laughing naturally when they are strewn upon the floor but you will do me the justice to admit that this was my misfortune and charlie's fault gabriel's flowers are not strewn upon the floor you see and it is gabriel's flowers that we are discussing are they not isabella there you make a great mistake i have heard and upon very good authority that upon palm sunday gabriel actually did have his church strewn with willow branches which he chose to call palms willow branches mark you actual willow branches and that seems to me even worse than having flowers upon the communion table miss vipart here fabia jumped again you will agree with me i am sure i think you said you were not a ritualist no but still mrs gaythorne you can hardly consider me an authority on such questions as i am not a christian mrs gaythorne fairly bounced in her chair not a christian miss vipart surely i cannot have heard you aright here poor charlie interposed wondering what evil spirit had prompted fabia's untimely confession to lure both herself and him to their destruction never mind mother what she is she's all right pon my soul she is and you'll be awfully late for your meeting if you don't go at once his mother brushed him aside as if he had been an irritating midge silence charles i have yet four minutes then turning again to fabia do i understand you to say that you are a heathen miss vipart practically so i am afraid then how do you expect to be saved i don't expect it i don't expect anybody to be saved not you nor i nor anybody else here charlie gasped and even isabel held her breath the mere idea of not expecting mrs gaythorne to be saved seemed almost stupendous in its blasphemy poor charlie felt that all was over between himself and fabia and isabel considered that whatever punishment the affronted lady chose to inflict upon the culprit would be well deserved so they both waited in helpless silence to see what form the merited chastisement would take but they had reckoned without their host 
mrs gaythorne rose from her chair and walked majestically across the room to where fabia was sitting and laid her beautiful hand upon the girl's shoulder my dear she said and her voice was no longer strident but reminded charlie of what it used to be when he was ill as a little boy i should like to see more of you and to help you if you will come to my house i will read to you and pray with you and do all that i can under god to teach you to be his child then before the other three could recover from their astonishment charles my cab it is twenty minutes to six charlie and isabel were dumbfoundered they thought they knew mrs gaythorne out and out but they had never calculated upon her behaving in this way they were altogether out of their reckoning for they had forgotten that there is a power stronger than prejudice or bigotry or invincible ignorance a power which constrains men and women to-day as it constrained the apostles of old the power of the love of christ End of chapter 4